Technology. Um, like I told you before, uh, cardio path is one of my favorite uh, things to talk about. And so um, we should have a fun lesson today um, talking about cardio path. Um, and so uh, just starting right off the bat, what we're going to do today is we're going to start off with uh, basically go through life. And so we'll talk about what are the cardiac pathology issues that can face uh, neonates and babies and toddlers? Uh, after that, we're going to talk about what are the issues that can face adults? And then after that, we'll talk about uh, what are the problems that can face you know our geriatric population. And the adult geriatric population tends to mesh together. And so really the big dichotomy here is going to be what are our congenital cardiac pathologies and what are our, acquired cardiac pathologies okay and so before we get into our congenital cardiac pathologies we need to talk about this idea of left to right shunts and so um, last time that we met we talked about our different shunts and how uh, the pressure in the right atrium is so much lower than that of the left atrium and so in general when you have a hole in your heart, here's our right atrium, our left atrium, our right ventricle, our left ventricle, no matter where the hole is in the heart, because the left ventricle has so much more muscle and the left atrium has a higher pressure, in general, whenever you have a hole in the heart, whether it's atrial or ventricular, you're gonna have blood moving from the left to the right, okay? Just as a general rule. Whenever you have a hole in the heart, that's the way that blood likes to go. And so, as blood is moving from the left to the right, now what's going to happen is that right side of the heart is going to have to work a lot harder. We talked last time about how our atrial septal defects can result in that uh, prolonging of our um, second heart sound and why that would be. And what we said was that now that we have a hole in the heart, the right heart has to work a lot harder than the left heart. Okay, and so that's going to cause a prolonged uh, split to our S2. That's the immediate problem. Okay, but what, what's the long term problem as this right heart has to continue to pump and pump and pump all that extra blood? Well, uh, just like when we go to the gym and we, you know, pump and pump and pump all this weight, uh, the muscle is going to start to grow. And whenever muscle starts to grow, we're going to have a stronger contraction, right? So before we didn't have that much muscle on the right ventricle, because typically when the right ventricle pumps, it pumps against a very low pressure in the pulmonary tree. In the pulmonary circulation, there's not a high pressure. Uh, but as this right side of the heart is having to pump harder and harder, muscles getting bigger and bigger, now it's generating much more force, okay? And so the pressure in this right ventricle is gonna start to increase over time. Okay, and it's going to continue to increase, continue to increase. Um, as this hole remains open, that pressure is just going to be going up and up and up as long as that hole is open. As long as there's blood moving over from the left, the pressure is going to continue to increase in the right. Now, eventually, what can happen is that the pressure gets so high on this right side that the pressure actually becomes greater than the pressure on the left. At that point, we would have a crossing back over of blood. At that point, we would have a right to left shunt. Now that the pressure is so much higher in that right side of the heart than the left side of the heart, that's gonna determine where blood goes, okay? And so this is the whole idea behind shunts and uh, really the core of what you need to understand relating to these questions about early shunts, um, early cyanosis, and late cyanosis. Uh, you have to be comfortable with this idea that uh, because the left side of the heart has a higher pressure, wherever you have a hole, we're going to have blood crossing over from the left to the right. However, as the pressure starts to build on that right side over time, eventually, you know, we have to wait a long time, right? We have to wait for that muscle to build up and, you know, for these pressures to really increase. It takes time. But eventually what's going to happen is the pressure becomes greater on the right than the left and blood is going to cross back over. Okay. All right, great. So that's sort of the core 
of what you need to understand about this. So now we can get into kind of the details about our left to right shunts. So here we're talking about anytime you have a hole in the heart, right off the bat, what's gonna happen as soon as you have that hole? Well, initially, we're not gonna have cyanosis, okay? Why is that? Well, blood that we have coming to this left atrium is gonna be oxygenated blood coming from the lungs, okay? We have nice oxygenated blood coming from the lungs. It enters the left atrium. And in this example, we're just going to use our ventricular septal defect, a hole in the ventricle. So this, o this oxygenated blood is coming into this left atrium, will progress into the left ventricle. And what's going to happen is because we have a hole there in the left ventricle, blood is going to move from the left to the right. Okay, and this is oxygenated blood. So now we have oxygenated blood mixing with deoxygenated blood, and the blood here in the right ventricle is going to go back to the lungs. Okay, and so we have that mixed oxygenated blood um, getting fully oxygenated, coming back around, and then by the time that blood gets back to the left ventricle, it's normal blood. Okay, and so while we have blood that's being pumped from the left ventricle into the right ventricle, we also have that blood being pumped out into the aorta okay, into the rest of the body, okay? And so the blood that's being pumped to the aorta and the rest of the body is oxygenated blood, okay? It's good blood, nice red oxygenated blood, okay? So children born with a left to right shunt will not be cyanotic early in life. They have good oxygenated blood going to their whole body. Yes, we have some crossing back over via the VSD, or via an ASD. However, that blood just goes to the lungs and gets oxygenated anyway. Yes, we have this uh, time bomb ticking that we discussed earlier. That time bomb is ticking and eventually we may have a change in where this blood is going, but early in life, it's not cyanotic, okay? What do we look for? Shortness of breath when uh, you know this patient exerts themselves. Uh, you can hear some murmur. The typical way that this murmur is described is going to be uh, at the left sternal border, um, just right at that left sternal border. Okay, and so you're going to put your stethoscope, you know, in the third, fourth, fifth intercostal space, right at the sternal border, and you're looking for a systolic murmur. Okay. So we're going to say LSB, left sternal border, and we are looking for a systolic murmur, okay? We're looking for blood that's moving from the left to the right during systole, okay? During diastole, we won't hear much because that's a pretty passive part of our cardiac cycle, all right? Here it says arrhythmias, okay? And so this idea of arrhythmias is something else that we have to talk about briefly. So uh, what what is an arrhythmia? Just sort of, um, how, how would you describe an arrhythmia? What does that word mean? Mm -hmm. Right, so it's just an abnormal rhythm, right? It's the heart is not going as it's supposed to go. As you said, um, we have a, something is happening with the conduction that's not correct, and now the heart is beating in an abnormal way. Arrhythmia, you know, we make a big deal out of this word in medical school. All it really means is abnormal heart rhythm. And so a slow heartbeat, uh, bradycardia, that's an arrhythmia. Fast heartbeat, tachycardia, that's an arrhythmia. Anytime we have an abnormal heartbeat, we have an arrhythmia, okay? And so it's a very, very, very general term. And so I like to kind of be a little bit more specific and say, um, one thing that I worry about in these patients is going to be AFib. Okay, why AFib? Well, AFib is most commonly caused when you have a dilation of the atria. AFib is most commonly caused when you have a dilation of the atria. Okay, and uh, you can imagine there's a lot of different things that cause a dilation of the atria, right? For example, when we have mitral stenosis, that, that's, uh, that constriction of the mitral valve. Now blood is not moving from the left atrium into the left ventricle in a smooth and concise way. Instead, we have blood kind of backing up at that left atrium. In that case, because blood is backing up at the left atrium, that atria is gonna dilate. And I think that's pretty, that makes sense, right? Anytime we have a lot of blood backing up in an area, we're gonna have a dilation of that area, okay? And so this 
is certainly one of the cases where we're gonna to start to have blood backing up, okay? And so, as we have blood coming back from the left atrium and going into that right ventricle, we're going to have blood backing up here at the right atrium, okay? And so we can look for some sort of atrial fibrillation on that right side. Uh, as the ventricle starts to dilate, we can have some different types of arrhythmias, but really any abnormal heartbeat is possible when you start to have this abnormal blood flow. We're gonna have areas of the heart stretching that are not used to stretching, okay? Great. Uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. So this is what we discussed that's going to happen over time. Over time, this muscle on that right ventricle is going to start to get larger. It's having to pump way more blood than it's used to, right? It's gonna, it's been pumping, you know, 150%. And so because of that, it's, the muscle is going to continue to get larger and larger and larger until we start to see the reversal. Other things we can see is just sort of the typical stuff, dizziness and fatigue, very vague sort of symptoms, but certainly things that we can see. Okay. Now, in terms of remembering what would be a left to right shunt, if it has a three letter abbreviation, so our atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, or patent ductus arteriosus, always think left to right shun, okay? All three of these cases are going to be left to right shuns, okay? And so we should be comfortable with that, okay? So what questions do you have on left to right shuns? Okay, good, yeah, we're just getting started, right? We're just getting warmed up. Um, so let me ask you, if we have this right ventricular hypertrophy and blood starts to go into the opposite direction, what do we call that? Uh, when we have this right ventricular hypertrophy, pressure starts to build on the right side of the heart. And eventually the pressure gets higher than it is on the left side of the heart. Okay, And then blood is now going from the right side of the heart to the left. We have a right to left shunt, right? So that whole process of that happening is called something is something called the Eisenmenger phenomenon. Okay, Eisenmenger phenomenon. All that means is the reversal of a left to right shunt to become a, uh, a reversal of a left to right shunt to become a right to left shunt. Okay, and so uh, we'll talk about that uh, here on this slide uh, by talking about our atrial septal defects. Okay, and so you can see here in this diagram that we have two main areas that we can have an atrial septal defect. We can have the primum type ASD, where we have a septal defect that's very close to the endocardial cushion. Okay, the endocardial cushion is an embryologic structure that grows upwards to give us the, uh, the separation between our atria and grows downwards to give us uh, the separation between our ventricles, okay? And so we have a uh, intraventricular septum and an atrial septum, and sort of the bottom parts of both of those areas are given by this endocardial cushion, okay? So whenever you hear endocardial cushion, I'm sure you've heard this term before, endocardial cushion defect. It was something that I had heard when I was studying and no one really explained to me, like what the heck, endocardial cushion? Like, am I sitting on a couch? What is this? Um, so the endocardial cushion is really just a group of neural crest cells that uh, give us the uh, part of our intral atrial septum the, the, the wall between our atria and give us part of the wall between our ventricles, okay? That's our endocardial cushion. So our primum ASD is very close to that endocardial cushion, very close to the uh, beginning of the intraventricular septum. Our secundum ASD is a little bit higher up, okay? And really the secundum ASD is physiological in babies. What do we call this in babies? It's a certain type of foramen, right? That's okay. Yes, yes, you're right. It closes with the medication. Uh, this one's the foramen ovale. Yeah, ovale. Because if you look at it, um, you know, if you you know take somebody's heart out, uh, somebody you really don't like, and then you take a look inside the atrium, what you're gonna see is that if you're looking at this wall, it looks like there's a giant oval, okay? 
And so that's your secundum area. If this hole stays open, that would be a secundum ASD. Okay. And so for the most part, when we have a patient with a atrial septal defect, it's probably going to be this type, the secundum type, the foramen ovale, uh, which is normally open as the baby is, is growing up uh, embryologically, as the baby is developing, this allows for oxygenated blood to go to the baby's body, okay? However, after the baby's born, we like this to close because now we're gonna have deoxygenated blood coming through this hole. We don't want that. If it stays open, we call it an ostium secundum, okay? So this is our most common type of ASD. If they give you, your patient has an ASD, and they don't tell you anything else, I want you to choose ostium secundum, okay? Otherwise, there is this ostium primum, which is associated with Down syndrome. And as we go through this course together, anytime we're, we talk about a um, anatomy defect in relation to Down syndrome, I'm going to point you in the direction of neural crest cells. Okay, because what we find in Down syndrome is, you know, Down syndrome, trisomy 21, what we find there is that many of the pathologies associated with Down syndrome are actually some problem with neural crest cells. Okay, so here in the atrium, we talk about the endocardial cushion. The endocardial cushion is made up of neural crest cells. The patients with Down syndrome have issues with neural crest cell structures, and so they get this primum ASD. A second example, let's say that we have a patient born with Down syndrome. We know because the baby has all the facial features, plus we had the, the testing that was done, confirmed Down syndrome, okay? Uh, this baby uh, is in the NICU, is in the NICU for one week and has not pooped a single time, okay? What do we think might be wrong with this baby? Yeah, if the baby hasn't pooped for a whole week, we know the baby has Down syndrome. What GI problems associate with Down syndrome that might prevent the baby from pooping? That's okay, I'll give you another, another hint. So we, we shoot some barium up this baby's butthole, right? And what we see is that, I'm gonna draw the colon here, okay? What we see is that the distal colon is very, very thin and then as we move proximally, it's very, very dilated. Okay. All right. So that's what we see when we look at the barium. And then so we take a biopsy of this part of the GI tract. And what we see is that it's missing its ganglion neurons, its myenteric plexus. So, so this one is going to be the Hirschsprung. Hirschsprung's disease, right? strongly associated with um, Down syndrome. If they give you a patient with Down syndrome, hasn't pooped, we start to think about Hirschsprung's disease, where in this portion of the, of the GI tract of the colon, it's missing neurons that allow for relaxation and allow for fecal matter to pass by, okay? So that section is missing the neurons. Guess where those neurons come from? Neural crest cells, very good. Very good, yes. So when we talk about Down syndrome and we talk about all of these weird things that are associated with Down syndrome, really there's really one, uh, there's one bad guy at play here and that's the neural crest cell is not doing his job, okay? All right, great. So done talking about uh, GI, right? We're saving that for another time. Let's get back to the heart here. So uh, we have a patient with an ASD. You know, if they don't give us any more information, we're gonna say it's the secundum type. The foramen ovale has stayed open. Great, okay. So what are some of the complications that we are worried about? Well, first is a paradoxical emboli, okay? So what do we mean by paradoxical embolus? So typically, when we have, uh, say we have a patient with a um, DVT in their leg, okay? D DVT means they have a, this big blood clot that's forming in their leg. Our worry when we have patients with a DVT is yeah, exactly, it's gonna go to the lung, it's gonna be a pulmonary embolism, this patient's gonna be short of breath presenting to us, uh, a very, very scary situation, right? Um, now, 
let's say instead that we have a patient with a DVT and they come in with a stroke. And we're thinking, okay, whoa, how did this clot bypass the lungs? No pulmonary embolus in this patient. Somehow this clot bypassed the lungs and went straight to the brain. How did that happen? Well, if we look at this secundum atrial defect, we can see if here's our foot, right? And so here's our calf muscle, all swollen. And here's our clot. This clot breaks off, enters the right atrium via the IVC. And instead of going into the right ventricle, it goes skirt and goes straight over here into the left atrium. Okay, via that atrial septal defect, it's able to cross from the right atrium to the left atrium. Now it enters the left ventricle, it gets pumped out the aorta, this middle guy here takes me straight to the carotid, and then boom, we have a patient with a stroke secondary to a DVT. Okay, so when we see this term paradoxical emboli, that's what we think of. We think of an embolus coming from, you know, typically a DVT, uh, that instead of going to the lung and causing uh, a pulmonary embolus, we have a emboli that goes to the brain. Okay, great. And then we have this thing called Eisenmenger syndrome. What is this? What is Eisenmenger? <laughs> good, good. Okay, I didn't catch you off guard. Good, yes. Eisenmenger syndrome is the presence of a left to right shunt over a number of years converting to a right to left shunt, okay? And you can see how in this first image of the secundum atrial septal defect, you know, having all this oxygenated blood coming over here to the right side of the heart, it's just gonna go through the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. It's gonna get oxygenated and come back. We may not even know. We have, may have no idea that there's a hole there. Now, if instead this, now once this right ventricle starts to really get muscular, really get big, the pressure is going to increase here. So if the pressure is increasing in the right ventricle, you better believe it's increasing in the right atrium. Eventually, the pressure in the right atrium is going to get big enough. So that deoxygenated blood is going to cross to the left side of the heart. Now we have a child with blue fingertips, blue lips, cold extremities. Why? Because we have this, uh, we have the, a reversal of the shunt that's allowing deoxygenated blood to go to the extremities. Parts of our body are starting to become ischemic, hypoxic, lacking blood supply, no bueno, okay? So that's our Eisenmenger syndrome, that's what we worry about, okay? For our heart sounds, fixed S2 split, uh, we talked about this one, how you know the pulmonary, art, uh, pulmonary valve is closing so much later than the aortic valve, and so we expect to see that. You can also look for mid-systolic murmur in the pulmonic post, mid-diastolic in the tricuspid post, but these are not as high yield as knowing this, that you have that fixed S2 split. Okay, great. Now, a ventricular septal defect. Here we got the same thing. However, now it's in the ventricles. Uh, the ventricular septal defect happens to be the most common congenital heart defect. Okay, so if we took the population of the United States and looked at everybody's heart, what we would see is the most common thing for people to have is the ventricular septal defect, okay? And so keep that in mind because a lot of people get confused with this fact and the fact we learned on the last slide, that that, um, that uh, secundum osteum is the most common ASD, great. VSD is the most common overall, okay? And I think that's pretty straightforward, makes sense. We can see here in this beautiful diagram here how we have that blood coming from the lungs going into the left ventricle and oxygenated blood is moving into the right side of the heart. And so this patient typically is not gonna have too many symptoms um, until you know we, we have that reversal, till we have that Eisenmenger syndrome, okay? Uh, the two types, um, or well, there's three types, but really two that you need to know for your exam. Uh, there's, the three types are supracrystal, which is right by that uh, aortic valve. I'm sorry, the, um, yes, the aortic valve. Yeah, here we go, aortic valve, great. Uh, supracrystal, um, we have a paramembranous and a muscular, okay? And so the paramembranous is going to be the type that is uh, associated with the um, 
those neural crest cells right there at the endocardial cushion, okay? Uh, muscular is a little bit further down in the intraventricular septum, okay? And so they call it muscular because it's right there in the muscle. The, the most common type here is gonna be that membranous. We're looking for a defect that's right near the beginning of the intraventricular septum, okay? I doubt you'll be asked about that particular fact, but if you are, now you know it, okay? Uh, and also, the other thing I wanna mention is with those muscular ventricular septal defects, uh, typically it's not just one. Typically you get this Swiss cheese septum type of parents who you can see here where you have numerous small holes. You essentially just have a very thin septum uh, and so you've had all these holes form, okay? All right, there's some association with fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, that's probably the strongest one that you can know, but there's really a lot of associations with ventricular septal defects, uh, which makes them so common. All right. Let's see, what else can we say here about VSDs? I think that's, I think that's about it um, that I can think of for now. Okay, great. So let's keep moving here. The heart sounds that we look for, a hollow systolic murmur louder and tricuspid than mitral. Why is it hollow systolic? Well, we have blood that's moving from the left side of the heart through these holes into the right side of the heart. And so throughout systole, we should hear a murmur that begins and ends with systole, okay? Now, um, this is not a murmur that gets louder and gets quieter like our aortic stenosis. Um, it's gonna be basically the same volume throughout systole and we should listen it says here tricuspid and mitral post, and that's fine. But where I really want you to listen is right there at the left sternal border in the area of, you know, our, our third, fourth, fifth intercostal space. That's where I'd like you to listen for it. And it should be a holosystolic murmur. Why do I say listen there? Because if you think about uh, just the anatomy, where is the closest place to put your stethoscope to hear this part of the heart? It's going to be right there at the sternal border. Okay. And so... Uh, if you look right there at the sternum, this is where the right heart is. The sternum essentially protects most of the right ventricle. Okay, the left ventricle is almost kind of behind and, uh, and uh, juxtaposed there. Um, right behind the sternum is the right heart. If you just move right at the sternal border, it's, that's right where the ventricle is going to be. And so that's why we want to listen there for that murmur. Okay. Okay. Uh, next is our patent ductus arteriosus. This is another type of uh, murmur that is going to start with a left to right shunt. Okay, and so the ductus arteriosus. The purpose of the ductus arteriosus is to catch the oxygenated blood that is going to the pulmonary artery in a developing fetus, okay? And so just kind of going back into embryo for a minute, I know embryo's a pain. I hated learning embryo, as I'm sure you did, but uh, this is actually pretty important. And so the developing fetus is going to get all of its oxygen via this inferior vena cava, okay? We're gonna have oxygenated blood, okay? We're talking about a developing fetus here, right? So ignore the colors of the heart here. But uh, we have oxygenated blood moving into the inferior vena cava and moving into the right atrium. Now, how do we get that oxygenated blood to the systemic supply of a developing embryo or a developing baby? We cannot, that baby cannot take a deep breath, right? And get blood to go back to the left heart. So we have two big ways to get blood to the systemic supply. Number one is going to be that foramen ovale. Um, while when the oxygenated blood gets here to the right atrium, some of it is going to cross into the left atrium via the foramen ovale. From the left atrium, it's going to go into the left ventricle and be pumped out the aorta into the systemic supply. Okay, But not all the blood is going to go there. We still have this big opening here, and so some of the blood is going to enter that right ventricle. Now, if we have blood pumped to the lungs at this point, the lungs have a very high resistance. Before our baby takes its first big breath, the resistance in the lungs is very high. And so the blood here is basically going to be at a death sentence. Uh, luckily, however, um, through evolution, we've developed this ductus arteriosus. So when the right heart beats, it's going to pump blood directly, uh, bypass the lungs, and go right into the aorta. 
Okay, and so now we've caught all of the oxygenated blood. Nothing is going to the lungs. It's all going to be going to the systemic supply because it's bypassed the lungs. Okay, that's the whole name of the game is to bypass the lungs. So what are the two ways? The foramen ovale catches about 50, or probably about 70% of the blood. And then the rest is going to be caught by the ductus arteriosus, um, you know, uh, go, bypassing the lungs. Okay. And so we talked about what happens if the foramen ovale stays open. That's our secundum. That's our most common type of ASD. What happens if our ductus arteriosus stays open? Well, um, basically the same thing. We're going to have blood from the uh, left side of the heart, essentially from the left circulation, the systemic circulation, crossing from the aorta, a high pressure system, into the pulmonary artery, a low pressure system. Okay, And so that uh, blood is going to go to the lungs and we're going to have fully uh, oxygenated blood returning to the left heart. Okay, Now, we have something kind of special here in terms of our Eisenmenger phenomenon. Uh, look at where we are here. I'm just going to erase some of this chicken scratch that I made already. Um, as Where's my eraser? Hello, eraser, eraser. Okay, whatever. So uh, here is where our, our hole is, okay? Having your hole there means that... Okay, great. So... Because the hole is here, we've already given off blood to the brachiocephalic, okay? This is going to give oxygenated blood to our right upper extremity and our, and our brain via the carotid. We've given off our left common carotid, okay? So this is going to give oxygenation to the left common carotid artery and to our brain. We've given off the left sub subclavian. Okay, so our upper extremities, our head, our brain, everything is going to be oxygenated. However, everything downstream, as we start to have crossing over of deoxygenated blood, is going to be affected and become cyanotic. Okay, so when it comes to the Eisenmenger syndrome in patent ductus, ductus arteriosus, we look for a lower extremity cyanosis. Okay, this is something very... Um, different and specific, and I don't want you to miss this if they give it to you on the exam. They're going to give you everything that you know, and then they're going to try and trick you by saying it just the lower extremities are cyanotic. Okay. Does this does that make sense? Why you see just the lower extremities? No. So so essentially, what's happening here? Um, let me get my eraser again. So let's look at. Let's look at what is going to happen initially at birth. So at birth, we have the aorta here. The pressure in the aorta is going to be about 120 millimeters of mercury, right? That's our systolic pressure. In our pulmonary artery, the pressure is going to be maybe 25, okay? And so at birth, what's going to happen is oxygenated blood is going to pass into the deoxygenated side, okay? So we have a high pressure. Uh, moving towards the low pressure. Okay, so we have oxygenated blood going into the pulmonary artery. It's going to go to the lungs. It's going to return to the left heart, fully oxygenated, go back into the aorta and do the whole thing again. Okay, so now as we have more blood here in the pulmonary artery, pressure is going to increase. It's going to go from 25 to 35 to 55, okay, to 65. It's just going to keep going up and up and up. Eventually, we're going to have a pressure here that's higher than the aorta, 125, okay? So now that the pressure in the pulmonary artery is higher than the pressure in the aorta, in that case, blood, instead of going into the pulmonary artery from the aorta, this blue deoxygenated blood is going to be moving into the aorta from the pulmonary artery, okay? This is the same phenomenon that we saw in the heart. It's just sort of in a different spot here. Okay, same phenomena. As the pressures start to increase on one side, eventually it's going to reverse. Okay, so why do I say that it's only lower extremity? Well, the, pat the ductus arteriosus, I'm going to draw the aorta here that uh, a little bit better than it's drawn in that image. Okay, so here's our uh, aortic arch. Okay, here's the aorta coming off. Okay, and here's our ductus. Okay, and so this is going to our abdomen, our legs, the rest of the body, 
Okay, here's the left ventricle here pumping into the aorta. Okay, great. So I made you label these the first day together. Uh, this is B, C, S, our brachiocephalic, our common carotid, and our subclavian. Okay, so our brachiocephalic is going to give blood to our right arm, our right common carotid. Our, our common carotid on the left is going to give blood to the uh, common carotid, right, and uh, to our brain. And the left subclavian is going to worry about our left arm. So we have oxygenated blood, good red blood, leaving the left ventricle, and it's going to branch off and go to the brachiocephalic. Great. Okay, so now we have oxygenated blood going to the brachiocephalic. Uh, we have oxygenated blood going to the carotid here. Okay, that's great. That's what we like to see. We have oxygenated blood going to the subclavian. Okay, now as the rest of the blood that's trying to go to the rest of the body moves towards the uh, descending aorta, at this point we have blood crossing over from the pulmonary artery. This is deoxygenated blood. It's crossing over from the pulmonary artery and mixing. Okay, and so while the oxygen tension in this blood here was, you know, say 100, 100, 100 and the oxygen right here is 100 but guess what we have deoxygenated blood with an oxygen tension of 30 coming out of the pulmonary artery where there's a higher pressure and mixing here so now the oxygen tension in the blood that's going down to our descending aorta is about 50 okay and so what we end up seeing is that as the abdominal aorta becomes the uh, iliac arteries and turns to the femoral artery and goes to our toes uh, that blood is going to be already deoxygenated because it mixed with the blood coming from the pulmonary artery. Okay. What questions do you have? Okay. Okay, great. Um, and so we see that lower extremity cyanosis. That is, if you ever see it described in a question where your patient has um, cyanosis in the lower extremities, but uh, upper extremities look good, face looks good, please think about patent ductus arteriosus, okay? And what, what is the, the murmur, and we'll set it, what is the murmur that we usually hear with this type of um, defect? Machine, right? Yes, good. So we listen for that machine-like murmur because during systole and diastole, there's always blood moving through that uh, a PDA, okay? Great. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to say is, so this is lower extremity cyanosis. Now, there's another thing that is sometimes described where we have high blood pressure in our upper extremities and low blood pressure in our lower extremities. Okay. Don't get that confused with this. That is your coarctation of the aorta. Coarctation of the aorta, think your Turner syndrome patients. What happens is uh, the aorta gets narrowed as it moves downwards, typically around the area of the ductus. And because the, the aorta gets narrowed, the pressure increases in our upper extremities and it gets lower in our lower extremities. Okay, that's our coarctation. We're gonna talk about it in a few slides, but in that case, they would say lower extremity, low blood pressure, upper extremity, high blood pressure. Here, we have upper extremity, normal, normal oxygen tension blood, lower extremities, cyanosis, okay? Okay, so a uh, newborn, presence of a newborn with cyanosis and a PDA does not point you to a right to left shunt. Why? Because initially PDAs are always left to right. Okay. Heart like sound, heart sounds is the machine like murmur. Great. Okay, so our Eisenmenger syndrome, we've talked about this at length today. This is not going to be in the child's early life. Okay, if you have a child that's born, and it is blue, then you know it's not a PDA, it's not an ASD, it's not a VSD, okay? Because all of those murmurs that we've just talked about, they don't become cyanotic until very late. We need to wait for that right ventricle to get super big. We need to wait for the pressure to build up higher on the right side than the left side for that baby to get cyanotic, okay? So your baby should be three, four, five years old at least before they start to become cyanotic. Okay, so I'm gonna say that one more time. If your baby is born cyanotic, it's not a ventricular septal defect. It's not an atrial septal defect. It's not patent ductus arteriosus, okay? Because guess what? Those are gonna be answer choices. When you take on this question and they're asking you and you've got a six-month-old baby who's cyanotic, uh, 
one of the answer choices is going to say VSD. And it's going to be calling your name. Oh, I remember VSD. It's the most common congenital heart defect. I want to pick it so bad. But then you're going to remember me uh, yelling at you and telling you that babies with VSDs are not cyanotic. Okay, it takes too much time for it to develop. Okay, great. So, right ventricular hypertrophy leads to pulmonary hypertension. Eventually, the right heart pressure becomes greater than the left heart pressure. We have a reversal of the shunt and cyanosis, which in the PDA is going to be the lower extremities. Okay, so we look for polycythemia and increased red blood cell count. We can look for digital clubbing. Okay, and uh, those are some of our signs besides the cyanosis. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our, our defects that are cyanotic at birth. Do you have any questions on the last three before we move forward? No? Okay. Great, so right to left shunts here, cyanotic early in life. So when you have a baby that's born and the baby is blue, please look for one of the five terrible T's. Whatever answer choice you choose should have T as the first letter. It makes life so much easier, so much easier, right? So tetralogy of Fallot, transposed great vessels, truncus arteriosus, tricuspid atresia, and total anomalous pulmonary vein. These uh, really nicely go in order of most high yield to least high yield, um, you're, mo you're more likely to get a question about tetralogy than you are to get one about TAPV, okay? In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a question on TAPV. Um, but tetralogy, you're probably gonna have two or three questions about that, okay? So make sure you really focus in on what is going to earn you the most points. We wanna be efficient with our time. Tetralogy of Fallot, this is associated with DeGeorge syndrome. Um, and what we see four problems, right? It's a tetralogy, tetra means four. Uh, and what we see is the first problem is this subpulmonic stenosis, okay? And what that means is right there at just below the pulmonary valve, we have some stenosis, okay? Subpulmonic stenosis. You can see how narrow this pulmonary artery is okay so this is our subpulmonic stenosis and essentially it makes it hard for blood to go into the pulmonary valve and move up to the lungs because there's that narrowing anytime we have a narrowing we're going to have more resistance okay the second thing we look for is the overriding aorta all this really means is that our aortic valve and the aorta itself kind of shifts over to the right a little bit okay it's kind of like you know when you're on a plane and you have that big guy sitting next to you and you kind of since you're a little bit smaller, kind of like leans into your space a little bit, that's our overriding aorta. All this means is that it's sort of like moving, shifting over to the left, kind of like stretching out and taking up that free space, okay? Because of that, it's gonna be connected to both ventricles here, okay? Why? We have a membranous VSD, membranous VSD, okay? We talked about uh, membranous VSDs is the most common kind of VSD, and so that's what we see here in DeGeorge syndrome. Uh, we have this aorta that's on top of the left ventricle, and it's kind of on top of the right ventricle too, okay? And so that's why it's overriding aorta connected to both ventricles, okay? Now, the right heart is gonna be pumping blood that's coming over from the left, and it's trying to pump that blood into a stenotic area, into a very narrowed area. So that right heart is gonna have to work really, really hard even when our baby is in utero, okay? Due to that, we are gonna see some thickening of this ventricular wall, okay? So the fourth thing we look for is the right ventricular hypertrophy, giving us this boot-shaped heart, sort of the mnemonic or the, um, the sort of buzzwordy thing that we look for for Tetralogy of Fallot is this uh, boot-shaped heart, okay? Now, I just explained to you four things, like these are just four things that are totally separate and all happen to happen. This guy's got very bad luck, but I'm about to blow your mind and tell you that there's really only one thing wrong. There's really just one thing wrong. We call it tetralogy, have a lot of fun naming them. There's really only one thing wrong here. The one thing wrong is that this part of the septum that was supposed to develop right here, instead kind of developed over here. Okay, it kind of shifted upwards and over. 
okay? And so that gave it, that made a situation where we're missing part of our intraventricular septum and allowing blood to move over. The aorta is shifted over because it's trying to match where the septum is. The, this pulmonary uh, artery is stenotic because the septum is kind of pushing on it. And then the right ventricular hypertrophy is due to all of these other problems, okay? So really the big problem here is that we're missing that little bit of septum. It's kind of moved up and over, causing that stenosis for the pulmonary artery, giving us this nice big space for the aorta, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, when, when that was explained to me, it really kind of opened my eyes to what's really going on here. It's not these four random things that you need to understand. Really, it's just one thing that's gone wrong, and then everything else that's here is a consequence of that. Okay? Cool. So, what is a TET spell? Um, you, you will have this described to you in a question stem. You're going to have a child uh, who, when playing, randomly squats down and, uh, uh, and no one can explain it. Why does this child just randomly squat down? Well, what that child is trying to do, that child is trying to increase the resistance in the system. Okay, so let's think about what the situation here. We really just have one giant ventricle right? We have one giant ventricle that is just kind of sharing blood in this situation. And so what, every time that heart beats, the, the blood is going to go wherever it's easiest, okay? And so we have one stenotic area, and we have one big, fat, nice, wide area. And so all of this deoxygenated blood and the oxygenated blood is going to tend to want to go out the aorta, okay? And so when we have deoxygenated blood going out, out of the aorta, it's going to this child's brain, and the child's brain is registering this and saying, I'm getting a lot of deoxygenated blood. I needed to do something to get more oxygenated blood. Okay, so what this child will do uh, by squatting down, I'm gonna erase this stuff out. By squatting down, what happens is the pressure in the aorta increases. Okay, whenever we squat, whenever we make a fist, and really, um, whenever we use our muscles or squat down, we increase the pressure in our aorta, okay? Now that we're increasing the pressure in the aorta, blood doesn't want to go into the aorta. There's a high pressure there. It says, you know, it's just too much work to go into the aorta. Now I'm going to start to go into the pulmonary uh, artery, okay? Great. Now we have that deoxygenated blood, some oxygenated blood, but a lot of deoxygenated blood going to the lungs, coming back around, and then coming back to that left ventricle to be pumped to the rest of the body, okay? And so really, by squatting down, we increase our systemic resistance. We increase the resistance in our, our aorta. By increasing the resistance in the aorta, it makes blood more likely to go to that pulmonary supply rather than going to the aorta, which is great because a lot of that blood is deoxygenated. Now that the child has squatted down for a little bit, uh, it's that child has increased the amount of oxygenated blood in his entire system and he can go on and continue playing. Okay. So we can read what it says here. Sudden increase in cyanosis followed by syncope. The child will squat during a TET spell to increase the systemic vascular pressure and the pressure on the left heart. This is going to cause a temporary reversal of the shunt and decrease the symptoms, okay? Instead of deoxygenated blood crossing over and going into this nice wide aorta, there's too much pressure there. So this deoxygenated blood is instead going to go to the pulmonary supply, get oxygenated, then return to the heart where it will be pumped to the rest of the body as, you know, an oxygen tension of 120 or something like that, okay? Okay, what questions do you have for me on this? Particular. This this can be a tricky topic, and you're you're bound to get questions on it. Okay, okay, good. Uh, don't don't hesitate to stop me if it doesn't make sense. Okay. All right. Uh, so this DeGeorge syndrome. Do you happen to remember the exact mutation? That's okay. Twenty two Q eleven. Okay. Sometimes instead of being called the George syndrome, it's called 22Q11 syndrome. Um, and uh, that's sort of, there's a deletion there on that particular chromosome. Uh, 
And so with the George syndrome, what we see is we, can, we have this tetralogy of Fallot. We have um, this, these children don't develop their parathyroid glands. And so we look for hypocalcemia, okay? Um, we also look for some facial defects. Um, I think that's about it, okay? Tetralogy of Fallot, hypocalcemia due to lack of parathyroids and facial abnormalities. Okay, great. Transposed great vessels. Uh, so this one is going to be as associated with our maternal diabetes. What we see here, and this is kind of like mind-blowing, right? So we have our right atrium going to our right ventricle. Okay, that's normal. Now our right ventricle is pumping blood to the aorta. Whoa. Okay, so instead of the right ventricle pumping to the lungs, it's pumping to the aorta and pumping all deoxygenated blood, right? And so that's not good. Now let's look what's happening on the left. Left side of the heart is getting oxygenated blood from the lungs it's pumping that oxygenated blood where? Right back to the lungs, okay? That is not good. And so uh, the only way that this is really compatible with life is that you have to have some way of mixing blood. And so you can see on this diagram here that they showed an ASD, allowing this oxygenated blood from the lungs to cross to that uh, right heart supply and be pumped to the body, okay? So we're getting a little bit of oxygenation there. And the second thing is we have a uh, patent ductus arteriosus that's open. So when the left ventricle pumps back to the lungs, some of the blood's going to cross over into the aorta and uh, allow for oxygenation of, of the uh, lower extremities. Okay. So we need to see those other congenital heart defects. If the ASD is closed and the PDA is closed, this is not compatible with life, right? Because we have basically two closed systems that are not interacting with each other. Our oxygenated blood never interacts and uh, is just going right back to the lungs. These things are going on a circle, okay? So that's our transposed great vessels. Uh, they love to ask about this. Keep that PDA open with prostaglandins, okay? How do we close? Oh, okay, it's right here. Uh, never to be open again with endomethacin, okay? The way I remember this is that endomethacin goes in the PDA and closes it, okay? If you want to close something, you have to go inside and close it. Uh, however, um, it will stay patent, stay open with prostaglandins. Okay. Uh, on x-ray, the uh, sort of buzzwordy thing we look for is this, this description of an egg on a string where it looks like our heart is just kind of hanging limply there. Okay. Great. This one's pretty straightforward. Not really too complicated, right? Essentially, we just have two systems. Um, what you need to know about this Keep open your PDA, keep open your ASD. Uh, how do you keep them open? Give prostaglandins, and then there's that associate, association with uncontrolled maternal diabetes, okay? Not a lot to memorize about transposed grave vessels. Uh, you know, going into this topic, there's a lot of like things that are kind of scary, uh, you know, congenital embryo embryology. It's all stuff that we kind of want to leave in the past, right? But this one's not too bad. Um, our truncus arteriosus here, all that really happens is that our aorta and our pulmonary artery are joined as one, okay? And so you can see we just have one valve here going to both of them, and it's taking both oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. We get biventricular hypertrophy, okay? Okay, tricuspid atresia. In tricuspid atresia, our tricuspid valve doesn't develop. Okay, and so because of that, our right ventricle doesn't develop. So blood that returns to the right atrium needs an ASD so that it can cross over into the left atrium and be pumped into both the uh, pulmonary artery and the aorta, okay? So in tricuspid atresia, all you're looking for is the lack of a right ventricle, okay? That's our tricuspid atresia. And, uh, you know, the only thing you really need to memorize here is that you have to have that ASD and VSD in order for, um, in, in order for it to be compatible with life. You have to have an ASD and a VSD. Okay. Total anomalous pulmonary veins. Here we have uh, pulmonary veins that are returning to the SVC instead of returning to the left atrium, okay? So you can see that normally your pulmonary veins should be coming back to the left atrium, but here it's sort of bypassing, going to that right atrium, and then passes back to the left atrium via that ASD, okay? 
Here we can look for a figure eight sign on x-ray. It's also been called the snowman sign. It really just kind of looks like if you look at that uh, chest x-ray, it kind of looks like a, like a snowman. Um, and so that's sort of what we can look for. Right ventricular hypertrophy, cardiomegaly, a nice big heart. Okay, great. The next congenital heart uh, condition we can talk about is our coarctation of the aorta. And we mentioned before, this is gonna cause hypertension in the upper extremities and hypotension in the lower extremities. This has a strong connection to Turner syndrome. Okay, so what does a Turner syndrome patient look like? If they just, because sometimes they're not gonna tell you, oh, you're, this patient has Turner syndrome, they're gonna describe them for you. So what will they say when they describe it for you? Is it male or f short? Good. Male or female? Good. Mm hmm. Yep, web neck. Yeah, widely spaced nipples. Yep, they always put that in there. Um, I think that's it, right? Streak ovaries, right? Uh, they don't have, uh, they have no ability to reproduce. And what is the um, genetic abnormality with Turner syndrome patients? Do they have an extra chromosome? Um, do they have a deletion? Are they missing a chromosome? Yes, they have a deletion of their entire X chromosome. And so the uh, patients with Turner syndrome are 45, right? Normally we should be 46. These patients are 45 XO, okay? 45 XO, that's Turner syndrome. And I want you to really associate that with the coarctation of the aorta. They really, they really love to pair those two together, okay? So things we look for, yes, we have hypertension in the upper extremities, hypotension, absent pulses in the lower extremities. Um, because our bodies are very adaptable, uh, our bodies are gonna use alternative ways of getting blood to the lower extremities. And so what's going to happen is the vascular supply that is around our ribs, our subcostal arteries, they're usually these tiny little arteries that just feed the muscle uh, in between our ribs. However, because those subcostal arteries connect with arteries that go all the way to our lower extremities, they anastomose with arteries that go to our lower extremities, those arteries are gonna start taking some of the blood supply. So those arteries are gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, because our ribs are not used to having big arteries under them, we're gonna get something called rib notching. We're gonna have rib notching. Rib notching. And what that looks like is normally when we have a rib, it looks a bit like this, okay, nice and smooth. And that tiny little artery is along the bottom, okay, and it's just carrying the blood that is supposed to come, that's what that it's supposed to carry. However, in coarctation, what happens, this is the upper side of the rib, the lower side of the rib starts to kind of look scalloped or notched, okay. Why is that? Because the artery that's the subcostal artery has gotten much bigger so that it can carry some of that blood to the lower extremities. Our bodies are adaptable and they're utilizing our subcostal arteries to carry blood to the lower extremities. Okay. These are normal, these are abnormal. Look for rib notching with coarctation of the aorta. Okay. Great. Um, and so there's our two types of coarctation of the aorta. There's a preductal coarctation, and this is what we see at B. This is a coarctation that's before the ductus, right? Uh, and then there's our postductal, uh, which is associated with rib notching and, uh, and collateral circulation. Really, both of these are associated with rib notching, so I could I should try and uh, change this slide. But um, postductal, if you hear that described, it's a little bit lower after the ductus arteriosus. Preductal is going to be before the ductus arteriosus. Okay. Great. And what do we look for? Mid systolic murmur, uh, decrescendo diastolic murmur at the aortic post. Okay. Any questions on coarctation? No? Great. Okay. We've got a couple of memes here. Not sure if I hit my thumb on something or splinter hemorrhage from infective endocarditis. I mean, who hasn't had this thought, right? <laughs> Has a big heart cardiomyopathy. That's unlucky. So uh, we're going to start talking about all of our pathologies. Uh, but before we really make that jump, do you have any questions on those congenital heart diseases?
No, okay. Great, so starting with our acute rheumatic fever. This is a high yield, high, high yield uh, topic, okay? I'm gonna put two stars here. This is a two star topic. So acute rheumatic fever, we look for a systemic manifestation two weeks after group A strep pharyngitis, okay? Now, the first thing I wanna say about this disorder before I say anything else is that all of these symptoms are not due to the bacteria themselves. This patient may have completely cleared this, the strep pyogenes infection, right? It may have uh, completely cleared it on its own using its own antibodies. However, because of this molecular mimicry due to the M protein that looks a lot like a protein that we have on ourselves, we're going to have all of these manifestations, all of these problems, okay? That's the first thing I want you to know. This is not something that, you know, once we have acute rheumatic fever, it's no longer a bacterial infection. Now we have some autoimmune state, okay? So our Jones criteria for acute rheumatic fever, uh, this is a good one to know uh, because if they give you these five things, then you instantly have your diagnosis and it cannot be anything else, okay? So look for polyarthralgia in the joints, you know, Patients complaining that their joints are painful. Uh, the O is a heart, and this is our pancarditis, especially our valvulitis, right? And the valve that we really look for is going to be our mitral regurgitation, okay? That is the highest likelihood of thing that we would see in acute rheumatic fever. Uh, for the heart is going to be that mitral regurgitation. Nodules on the skin that are painful, these subcutaneous nodules. Uh, erythema marginatum is not painful, but it's essentially a, uh, a lesion on the skin where you have a very bright red border and the inside of the lesion looks a little bit pale, okay? That's our erythema marginatum. And uh, we can, as the acute rheumatic fever involves the brain, start to see Sydenham chorea. This is very, very rare, okay? And so if on a question stem you were given these first four things, or even just these four first three things, look for acute rheumatic fever. Look for a history of a pharyngitis um, that was untreated because, uh, you know, a lot of times that's going to cinch your diagnosis and it really makes answering these questions much easier, okay? So uh, other things we can look for, ASO titer should be positive, okay? Positive ASO. Uh, sterile vegetations on the heart valves giving us that mitral uh, regurgitation, that murmur a high sedimentation rate. Whenever you see this sedimentation rate or something called ESR, okay, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, this is something that you're gonna see in a lot of different inflammatory conditions, autoimmune condition, you know, lupus or, um, you know, uh, our rheumatoid arthritis. All, a lot of these conditions have elevated ESR. All ESR means is that there's inflammation, okay? And I say that because this was another thing that was sort of not really explained to me at some point, so I kind of had to look it up and figure it out for myself. Whenever you see elevated ESR, all that tells you is that there's inflammation, okay? And so will you see elevated ESR in a bacterial infection? Yes, that's inflammation, right? Uh, ESR will be elevated in ankylosing spondylitis. ESR is gonna be elevated in your patient with uh, polymyalgia rheumatica, any, any inflammatory autoimmune, any of these states, we're going to have elevated ESR. Your patient with colon cancer is going to have elevated ESR. Okay. So, you know, it's sort of one of those lab findings that it's like, this doesn't really help me, you know, like, great. Uh, now I know there's inflammation. I kind of already had that idea when I saw these giant nodules on the guy's skin, but thank you for this uh, helpful hint. Uh, so ESR that's there. Um, for us, uh, you know, uh, strep pyogenes is going to be a beta hemolytic streptococci. And uh, last, we can look for these Anichkow cells in the myocardium, which is just this uh, caterpillar chromatin. And so you can see uh, here's our cell. And then in the nucleus, the chromatin kind of takes on this caterpillar appearance. Okay. You, you're unlikely to be asked about this particular fact. They might give you this on the side, uh, but there's other stuff to figure out what's really going on type of thing, you know? A lot of times with histopathology, 
I'll point you out times when it's not true, but for the most, for most cases, you don't need the histopathology to get the diagnosis. Okay, um, it's helpful if you if you really don't know from the question stem what's going on. Sometimes the histopathology can give you a clue in the right direction, but don't expect to go into the step one exam and be diagnosing a bunch of diseases from histopath. Okay, because that's just not the case. You're always going to have a description of the patient to go along with this little pink box. Okay, and so with acute rheumatic fever, you can look for those uh, Anichkow cells and sort of, you know, maybe it's going to be a callback for you. Oh, I remember this slide. It had a bunch of writing on it and a weird cartoon, and that kind of reminds you of acute rheumatic fever. But otherwise, don't worry about being able to diagnose this right from that cell itself because I couldn't, I, I couldn't do that, right? And I, I've already taken a few of these exams, so um, just keep that in mind, all right? Okay, so uh, strep pyogenes, how do we prevent acute rheumatic fever? It really just comes down to giving some penicillin. Penicillin, ampicillin, a cephalosporin, any of these, um, you know, really safe, easy drugs. We want to treat the pharyngitis when your patient has it. Uh, why? Because it prevents stuff like this, okay? Eventually, this will go away. But the one thing that may not go away is that murmur. And that's why we include it here in our car, in our cardiology chapter. Because yes, uh, mitral regurge, not a great thing to have. Um, what's going to happen long term? That regurge is going to turn into a stenosis. Stenosis is going to lead to a dilation of our, uh, of our left atrium. And we said before, dilation of a left atrium is going to lead to atrial fibrillation, okay? Now that we have AFib, now we're gonna be forming clots on the wall of our atria, okay? Now we have clots that are going to the brain. Okay, it just gets worse and worse and worse. So we need to treat strep pharyngitis when our patient has it to prevent these long-term problems, okay? So chronic rheumatic heart disease, is gonna be valvular scarring secondary to continuous repeated inflammation, eventually leading to stenosis, okay? And so our mitral valve stenosis kind of has this fish a mouth appearance. Um, I can I can definitely see that. That looks like a fish staring right at me. We have thick cord tendine, thickened cusps. Um, if instead the rheumatic heart disease inval involves the aortic valve, we could have aortic valve insufficiency and regurgitation. Okay, so we always talk about uh, rheumatic fever involving the mitral valve, but it can also involve the aortic valve. Okay, it's just sort of like the most likely is mitral, second most likely is aortic, third most likely would be something like the tricuspid valve. Okay, okay, so um, we talked about the big problem here being you know that left atrial dilation. Does that make sense why you know we don't want left atrial dilation? Yeah, okay, so with mitral valve stenosis, what kind of murmur would you look for? Uh, with mitral valve stenosis, uh, say you know you're you're in the clinic, your attending tells you that uh, go listen to this patient's heart. They have mitral valve stenosis. Before you put your stethoscope on and go listen, what do you expect to hear? You you could have you could possibly have a click, um, but we really associate that click with mitral valve prolapse, right? with that mid systolic click. Well, first first let before we think about specifically, do you expect to hear the murmur during systole or diastole with mitral valve stenosis? When is blood going to be moving through this valve? Sorry. What'd you say? Systole. So during systole, here's our left ventricle. Here's our aortic valve here. Here's our mitral valve. During systole, we're having blood pumped from the left ventricle out of the aortic valve. Okay. Now with mitral valve stenosis, the only problem that we have is when blood is supposed to be going through. Okay. So during systole, we wouldn't have a murmur. 
During diastole, however, when blood is supposed to be passing from the left atrium into the left ventricle via that mitral valve, that's when we should expect to hear the murmur. Okay, so this would be a diastolic murmur um, because with stenotic lesions, anytime you have a stenosis, you're only going to hear it when blood is supposed to be moving past it. Okay, excellent. Good. So uh, aortic valve insufficiency regurgitation. When do we expect to hear that murmur? This is going to be diastolic, right? because when the aortic valve is supposed to be closed, it's not staying closed, we have blood regurgitating backwards in the left ventricle, and so uh, that's sort of the problem, there you go. Okay, very good. So now we can talk about an actual bacterial infection of the heart. The last one was not a bacterial infection, this one is bacterial endocarditis. Uh, typically it's gonna involve an infection of the valve, and so this is sort of uh, what it looks like. We get this uh, vegetation that grows on the edge of a valve. Okay, as that uh, bacteria grows on the valve, every time that valve opens and closes, it's going to be shooting off little bits of bacteria to the whole body. Okay, you can imagine, you know, that this is the valve is trying to close shut. It can't close shut, but when it does try and close shut and it claps against that bacterial vegetation, a few little bacteria are going to pop off and go into the aorta. Okay, so as those little bits of bacteria pop off and go to all different parts of the body, that's when we can start seeing things like a splinter hemorrhage. All a splinter hemorrhage is, is a tiny little bit of bacteria that was on a valve of the heart, got dislodged, went through the aorta, through the subclavian, through the brachial artery, all the way down into the finger and just lodged right there at the edge of the finger. It's not enough to create a new infection, a new abscess or anything like that. This is just like one, two, three bacteria that are sort of being shed off every time the heart beats. And so that's gonna give us our splinter hemorrhage. Osler node, same thing. Just a few little bacteria kind of get shed off. They make it into that supply of the finger and give us the Osler node. Janeway lesion, same thing. Roth spot in the retina, in the back of the eye, same thing. We just have bacteria getting caught in tiny little capillaries. Okay, great. So most common cause of left-sided endocarditis is gonna be our strep viridans. Most common cause of right-sided endocarditis is gonna be staph aureus. And we really need to look at the patient history. Okay, and so for a patient who presents with a right-sided endocarditis, what, no, what sort of patient history do you look for with the right-sided endocarditis? With an infection, uh, sorry, what? I heard you say, yep, IV drug users, very good. You know, they are injecting right into their skin, everything that's on the needle, everything else is, is gonna be entering their, um, their uh, venous supply and going to the right side of the heart. So really, typically, we are going to look for a tricuspid valve um, lesion growing, okay? Great, so a uh, few clues to look for, mid-diastolic murmur with opening snap, our Janeway lesions, Osler nodes, uh, splinter hemorrhages, Roth spots. Another thing we can look for is that, so we have, I'm just gonna draw a valve here as we're looking at it from above, okay? So here's our valve, okay? And so blood is coming out of this hole and going into the aorta, right? Now, let's say we have this bacterial infection growing on the edge of the valve. Okay, so here's our bacterial colony. This is our bacterial endocarditis. Now, every time that valve opens and closes, a few little bacteria get shed off and give us our Osler, Osler nodes, splinter hemorrhages, all that good stuff, okay? A second thing is gonna happen. Every time a red blood cell tries to pass this bacterial colony, it's gonna get broken open, okay? Our red blood cells are gonna to start to be shed, okay? And so a second thing that you can look for in these patients is anemia. And that's like, whoa, holy cow, are you kidding me? Essentially, this colony growing on the edge of the valve is creating this really sharp serrated blade that every time the red blood cell tries to pass it, the red blood cell gets sliced open and uh, all of its contents get lost, okay? And so we're gonna be destroying red blood cells every time we have a cardiac cycle. These red blood cells are gonna be chopped up, 
we're going to have this hemolytic anemia and uh, so leading to basically uh, an anemia. Okay, so keep that in mind as something that you may see when they describe your patient to you. Okay. All right, great. What else can we say about this? Uh, da, 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 da. Great, great. Okay, awesome. So we have our Osler node here and our Janeway lesion. They both look very similar uh, and they both are coming from bacterial endocarditis. The big difference is one is painful, one is not. Can you please tell me which one of these would be painful, which one is not going to be painful? So the way that I like to remember this, because I get them confused all the time, is I always say, ouch, Osler. Ouch, Osler. <laughs> and that reminds me that if you press on these Osler nodes, they're actually quite painful. Um, we have a small little um, uh, inflammation growing there in the, in the finger, right there in the epidermis, and so it causes a bit of pain. Okay. Versus Janeway lesions are not painful, so we don't say anything about them. So ouch, Osler, and you're never going to forget it. So we talked about endocarditis. Going to the next layer of the heart is our myocarditis. This is an inflammation of the heart muscle itself. So the endocarditis, that's the lining of the heart. That's the valves of the heart. Myocarditis is the muscle of the heart. And so most commonly, we look for a viral infection, okay? So adenovirus, Coxsackie virus, these are going to be our number one causes of myocarditis. Symptoms here are going to be leg edema. Why? As we get inflammation of this muscle, the heart is not going to be beating as efficiently as it was previously. And so we're going to have blood backing up in our venous supply, leading to peripheral edema, uh, leading to pulmonary edema from the blood supply going to the left ventricle. Um, basically, everywhere that blood can be backed up, it does get backed up, and so that's what we look for. So leg edema, shortness of breath, uh, fever, uh, syncope, unable to lie flat because of all that pulmonary edema. Uh, because all of that muscle is inflamed, we can see arrhythmias. How do we test for this? Really, the best test is going to be to do an echocardiogram, to do an ECG, a white blood cell count, red blood cell count, and we can do blood culture if we're thinking bacterial. If we're thinking viral, we can't really culture, right? So really just that ECG, white blood cell, and red blood cell count, okay? And so on white blood cell count, um, the number that we look for for a sign of infection is going to be a number greater than 12,000. Okay. Whenever you see a number greater than 12,000, that is typically going to be indicative of a, some sort of infection. Okay. So always look for that 12 number when it comes to uh, infectious etiologies. How do we treat this? It's really, honestly, um, Natalia, it's going to be a supportive type treatment. And so we can diurese them if they have a lot of pulmonary edema. We can give them um, a Lasix pill. And they can kind of uh, urinate off a lot of that extra fluid. Great, that's helpful. Um, if they're having significant arrhythmias, we can do a pacemaker. Uh, antibiotics if it's bacterial, uh, steroids otherwise. And we just want to keep an eye out for pericarditis and cardiomyopathy. Okay, so for myocarditis, what do I actually need to know for the exam? Know the causes with adenovirus and Coxsackie virus being the most common causes. And know the symptoms. Okay, so anywhere... Uh, basically, we have a state where our heart has gone to um, has gone from having a normal ejection fraction, pumping out a lot of blood, to not really working that efficiently in a short period of time. So look for peripheral edema, pulmonary edema with a fever. Okay, that's how your patient's going to look. Okay. So pericarditis, now we've moved to the outer layer of the heart. So we had our endocarditis, which is the inner lining of the heart and the valves. We have our myocarditis, which is the muscle layer of the heart. Now our pericarditis is an inflammation of the protective layer of the heart. So what actually is the pericardium? Why do we need it? So the heart, as you know, is beating many, many, many times per minute. And there's two, there's two giant lobes right next to it. Uh, of the lung that are just kind of like sitting there actually laying on top of the heart. 
Now, if you have one organ that's moving around a lot and another organ has to stay still, that's gonna cause a lot of irritation to that second organ. And so our pericardium is this closed space with a tiny bit of fluid inside of it that basically is the lotion. It's the lotion of this whole system and it keeps the heart from really causing any uh, rubbing or inflammation against the, uh, against the lungs that are surrounding it. Okay, so the pericardium is very important for that. Now, the pericardium can have problems. Because it's a closed system, we can have accumulation of fluid in the pericardium, okay? And that's gonna compress the heart. We don't like that. Uh, we can have a inflammation of the pericardium where every time the heart beats, our patient's having pain and, uh, and it's making a noise. And so we don't like that as well. So the pericardium is a very good thing, but we have to talk about what goes wrong with it. So uh, causes here are gonna be very similar to our myocarditis looking for Coxsackie, looking for adenovirus. Your patient can even have influenza and develop pericarditis. Um, patients with kidney failure. This is one of those low-key facts that actually um, is quite high yield. Uh, low-key, but high yield. <laughs> uh, so when you have kidney failure, you have buildup of urea in the blood. Urea is very irritating to a lot of different parts of the body, including the pericardium. Okay, so in kidney failure, having this elevated urea can lead to pericarditis. And to be honest with you, this might be more of a step two type fact that you need to know, but I'm telling you now so that when you get there, you're already gonna be ready, okay? So kidney failure, think uh, accumulation of urea in the blood leading to pericarditis, okay? Any kind of heart surgery, open heart surgery, irritates the pericardium and can lead to a pericarditis. So what do we look for? A dry cough, uh, symptoms that look like pleuritis, okay? So pleuritis is an inflammation of the pleura, right? And that's not exactly what's happening here. We have an inflammation of, of the lining around the heart, which is near the pleura, and so it can look like pleuritis, where when your patient takes a deep breath, they have pain, okay? That's the, that's the classic sign of pleuritis. When your patient takes a deep breath, they have pain. Um, but what's actually happening is not actually a pleuritis, this is a pericarditis. Uh, fever, anxiety, uh, crackles due to accumulation of fluid upstream of the left atrium, pleural effusion, lower extremity swelling due to uh, backup of fluid from the right atrium, inability to lie flat for the same reasons. And the one thing I left off here, I must have been crazy when I made this slide, the one thing I left off here is the classic, classic sign of pericarditis, with, which is the pericardial crunch. Pericardial crunch. Okay, and I'm not making this up. This is actually what it's called. You can Google it and check me on this. It's called a pericardial crunch. And what it is, every time our heart beats, we have these two really irritated dry layers of pleura that are rubbing against each other. Okay, and so I've never heard it myself, but what I imagine is when you take a bag of potato chips and you kind of crunch it together, now imagine doing that 60 times per minute. Crunch, 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 crunch. Every time the heart beats, you're getting this little crunching sound. And this is really gonna be your classic sign of pericarditis. This is pericardial crunch that you hear when you auscultate your patient, okay? Pericardial crunch. I should, I don't know what I was thinking when I made this slide, I left that off, because this is probably the most important thing. And if you go into your, um, your first aid book, um, did you order it, by the way? Did you order your first aid book? Hasn't arrived yet? Okay, no problem. I think you'll probably have it for next week, uh, which will be good. Um, and you'll be able to check this and see if it's in first aid, your pericardial crunch. Okay. Uh, so we can auscultate and listen for that crunching sound. I don't know why this says MRI. You would never really do an MRI for this or really a CT. Those should not be there. I, I don't know what I was thinking when I made this slide. Um, echocardiogram. Oh, this, this slide is not there? This must be a new slide that I added in. I'm going to, uh, to update the drive today and make sure that this updated presentation, because I actually, before we met today, added some slides to the N2 on pharmacology. Um, and so, so I'll update this slide so it says the correct information and then put it on the drive, okay? Great, uh, CBC, again, we're looking for that white blood cell count greater than 12. WBC greater than 12,000, which is our sign of infection, okay? Treatment actually 
Uh, NSAIDs, just regular aspirin, can be very helpful for this. Aspirin is going to decrease that amount of inflammation and really result in, a, um, in an improved pericarditis state. Okay? That's especially true for something called Dressler syndrome. Okay? Dressler syndrome is a pericarditis that happens in patients that have a myocardial infarction, who have a heart attack. Patients that have a heart attack, they're going to have death of their uh, muscle of their heart. They're also going to have death of some of their pericardium. And so about, typically anywhere from 7 days to 21 days after a heart attack, your patients can develop a pericarditis and that is due to a Dressler syndrome. Okay, And that's just a fibrinous pericarditis secondary to a heart attack. Okay, How do you treat that? Aspirin. ASA. Classic drug, um, and that's going to decrease the amount of inflammation, decrease the pain for your patient, and really be uh, a good treatment. Now, as the inflammation gets worse, you may end up having a buildup of fluid inside of this pericardial pouch. This is not good, we said before, because now we are going to be compressing our left ventricle and our right ventricle, okay? And that's going to limit the amount of blood that can enter those spaces and be pumped out to our body. Okay, and so this is a very dangerous situation. This is something called cardiac what? Tamponade, excellent, cardiac tamponade. Uh, cardiac tamponade, not good. Um, cardiac tamponade is always gonna be due to fluid in the pericardium, okay? Compressing the left ventricle. So cardiac tamponade, how do we treat this? We do something called a pericardiocentesis, drain out whatever fluid or blood, whatever's in there, drain it all out, okay? analgesics. If uh, we're worried about um, a tamponade happening again, we can remove some of the pericardium via a pericardectomy. Okay. All right, great. Angina, um, this is just, uh, you know, pain, uh, chest pain, secondary to hypoxia of the cardiac muscle. That's what angina is. We can have uh, three main types of angina. Our stable angina is described as chest pain on exertion. Okay, and so uh, when we have stable angina, what we know is that somewhere in this patient's heart, their vessels are becoming obstructed. Okay, and so for chronic stable angina, you can see that we're starting to have development of an atherosclerotic plaque such that whenever our patient starts to exert themselves, they're going to start having chest pain. Their heart is not getting enough oxygen, not getting enough blood, and that's giving them the chest pain, okay? So this is typically caused by coronary atherosclerosis. What do we look for on EKG? ST depression. Uh, when we look at our cardiac muscle, okay, so here's our muscle, here's the inside of our left ventricle, okay, here's where all the blood is, this is the myocardium, and then here is, say, our left anterior descending artery, our LAD, okay, and so this is kind of like drawn in a different orientation than we're used to, right? So our left anterior descending artery is going to send down little arteries to perfuse all of this myocardial muscle, okay? And so this is how all of the muscle of our heart gets its blood supply. And uh, this is really the only blood supply that it's going to be able to get. It can't sample some of the blood in the left ventricle. It doesn't work like that, right? It has to get its blood from the left anterior descending artery, okay? So what's gonna happen is when we have this atherosclerotic plaque limiting the amount of blood coming through, uh, it's really gonna limit blood to areas that are furthest from the main blood supply. What do I mean by that? Uh, the arteries that are closer to the atherosclerotic plaque are gonna have more blood in them than those that are further away, okay? So uh, everything downstream from the atherosclerotic plaque, the further we go, the less blood that's available, okay? And so that counts even for how far blood is able to perfuse within the muscle itself. So when we start to have this obstruction, when we start to have this plaque building, what's gonna happen is this endocardium, the subendocardium, the muscle that is closest to the ventricle itself is going to become ischemic, okay? We call this subendocardial ischemia. On EKG, what this looks like is an ST depression, okay? 
when you have ischemia to this muscle on the innermost part of the myocardium, we call that subendocardial ischemia, and that gives us an ST depression. All right? So that is not a complete obstruction. It's just a partial obstruction, and we get that subendocardial ischemia. Now, with our unstable angina, this is when we're starting to get chest pain at rest. And so this is going to be most commonly caused by when we have one of these plaques, uh, the atherosclerotic plaque, that plaque is full of things that promote clots, okay? It's full of things that platelets like to stick to and just form a really nasty plot, um, uh, clot, excuse me. And so you can see this thrombosis. Essentially, when, you're, when your plaque ruptures, you can see that there's a layer of endothelium on this image, but here there's no layer of, endothel of endothelium because the plaque has ruptured. When the plaque ruptures, now a thrombus forms in that artery. Um, it should be an incomplete thrombus. It's going to give us chest pain at rest and a ST depression with subendocardial ischemia. Because some blood is still able to pass by, it's not a complete obstruction. Some, some blood is still able to pass by, so it gives us subendocardial ischemia. Okay. Now, when that thrombus progresses to involve the entire artery, you can see in this image that the thrombus is completely occluding that artery. This is what we call our myocardial infarction, our heart attack, our cell death. When we have a complete obstruction, going back to our image here of the LAD, if we completely obstructed this, then rather than having subendocardial ischemia, we would have ischemia of this entire wall. Okay, All of this stuff would be completely dead. Okay, so what does that look like on the EKG? That looks like an ST elevation. Whenever you have a complete obstruction of an artery, you're going to have cell death and you're going to see an ST elevation on your EKG. Okay, the way that I always remember this is that um, I thought of it from the point of view of the heart attack. Um, heart attack really wants to kill myocardium. And so if it only is able to cause a little bit of subendocardial ischemia, it starts to feel depressed, like sad, like, oh man, I really wanted to, to, to kill the whole wall here, but I couldn't. I'm depressed because I only killed a little bit of the wall. However, when you have a complete destruction of the wall, um, the heart attack, it feels happy. It feels elevated, so happy that it got a transmural ischemia. I know that's very, it's a very weird way to think about it now that I'm saying it out loud. <laughs> it makes sense. Uh, I think you're being nice, but, uh, but uh, good. <laughs> okay, good, good. So the heart attack, it's trying to kill the whole wall. It's happy when it does, and it gives you that ST elevation. And you will be asked about this, the subendocardial versus transmural ischemia. You will be asked about that. And so... Um, knowing what it looks like on EKG is very helpful for you, okay? Uh -huh, you're welcome. Um, so there's also this idea of a prinzmental angina. And so all you need to know about prinzmental is it's completely random. What's, what's happening here is if, if you look at this image here, rather than having some sort of clot that's obstructing or having some sort of thrombus here, the muscle in the wall of the arteries just randomly decides to spasm and close. So it's not gonna be related to rest or exertion. It's just going to be just a completely random event, okay? And so here we look for a ST elevation. Why? Because of the spasm, we're really completely limiting our blood supply. So we get a transmural ischemia, okay? And so the way you're gonna remember this is that stable and unstable angina cause ST depression and everything else causes ST elevation, okay? All right, great. Any questions on angina? It's a tough topic. I mean, don't don't try and uh, be a hero here. This is definitely a tough topic and something that um, is worth going over a few times. Um, what you'll notice about this slide is that looking at the text, there's not much written here. Uh, the reason for that is because I don't want you going into you know all of these cardiology textbooks and learning everything about angina. Okay, you can save that for step two. <laughs> You're gonna have to do it on step two. Don't do it now. Um, really, just just try and learn these very basic definitions. Stable angina is chest pain on exertion. Unstable angina is chest pain at rest. Both of those we see ST depression. 
Prince mental is a spasm. Prinz, it sounds like it's really z- 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 spasmy, right? That's what it sounds to me. Prinz is mental, very spasmy. So here we have a spasm. It's not related to exertion, not related to rest. It's just completely random. And in that case, we see ST elevation. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so if, we, if all of these was on a gradient, if all of these different... Uh, conditions we just talked about on the last slide were on a gradient. We would have principal being random. We would have stable angina being the earliest sign that our patient's going to have a heart attack. Our unstable angina is the second sign that we're getting closer to a heart attack. Myocardial infarction is the heart attack. Okay. And so we were familiar with the symptoms, severe crushing pain, uh, substernal crushing tightness. It radiates to the, to the arm, radiates to the jaw, to the shoulder, to the neck. Um, these are all the places that they can see. And another thing to keep in mind is that heart attack symptoms are different in women. Women present with vomiting, abdominal pain, uh, back pain. These things are a little bit different than your classic severe crushing pain where it's described in men. And this is sort of one of the ways that our culture um, is really kind of uh, taking a bias towards men and not really kind of giving women their due is that the thing that we're always trained to recognize is severe cr- crushing chest pain rating down the arm. Guess what? In a lot of women, it doesn't present that way, okay? And so you definitely, these are equal in terms of how important they are to know because uh, you can really get either when you get your question or even when you are in the hospital, right? So uh, other things that we look for, um, aside from the pain, uh, we look for shortness of breath. Uh, You know, uh, patients may pass out, low blood pressure, extreme weakness, sweating, heart rate. Um, And so what is happening here? We've had a complete occlusion of a coronary artery, okay? Um, that there's really two ways that that can happen. You can have an artery that had that atherosclerotic plaque, and then you had an embolus come along from somewhere in the body and get lodged here, completely blocking it, okay? So that's one way that we can get a myocardial infarction and a complete obstruction. The second way is we can have that atherosclerotic plaque where the edge of it ruptures open and it releases all of those toxic um, thrombus forming things into this, this area and that forms a thromba, thrombus, okay? So we can have an embolic stroke or a thrombotic stroke, but both of them are going to involve atherosclerosis, okay? Uh, for our most commonly implicated vessels, the number one is going to be our left anterior descending artery. This artery is called the Widowmaker. It kills so many people that it leaves their uh, loved ones behind, right? So they call it the Widowmaker. The right coronary artery is going to give us a posterior type um, picture on our EKG. Circumflex artery is going to be a lateral type picture, okay? And so uh, our STEMI, transmural, like we said before, you can also have a heart attack without having ST elevation. So that would be an end STEMI. Um, don't worry about the dichotomy there. Now we're really getting into some cardiology, um, step two stuff. Don't worry about the STEMI versus end STEMI difference. Not terribly important for step one, but just know that you can have a heart attack without having that ST elevation. It is possible. Okay. All right. And so be able to recognize this on your, um, on your question stem, okay? There's not a lot that gives you this beautiful plateau um, aside from having a heart attack, and that's when you really want to recognize it, okay? And so, uh, what questions do you have on our MIs? None? Okay. Okay. No problem. I mean, you know, and this is what we're doing together. We're, we're reviewing things together. Um, and so, you know, review it on your own time, but if there's something that you want me to explain again, don't hesitate to let me know. Okay. It's a beautiful thing about having one person in the class is it really becomes a one-on-one tutoring. So I'm happy to take the time to, to talk about things. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, we have a patient who has a heart attack. What sort of medications do we want to give? What things pop into your mind? 
Aspirin. <laughs> oh, I thought you said, hey, Siri. Hey, Siri. <laughs> sure yeah so maybe some morphine right morphine the beautiful thing about morphine is not only is it going to help with the pain it's also going to dilate veins Okay, so when we dilate veins, that is going to decrease the amount of blood returning to the heart. And so the heart's not going to have to work as hard because that's what we really want to avoid right now is stressing the heart. Okay, so morphine is an excellent choice. Let's give some morphine. Um, we can also give nitrates, right? That's another um, way of vasodilating. Okay, so nitrates are going to be great. Aspirin. Why aspirin? Because aspirin prevents clots. Okay, and what we have right now is a giant clot. Okay, so let's give some aspirin. Next thing we can give is beta blockers. Uh, beta blockers are gonna work on the heart and prevent them from working so hard. We're gonna decrease the contractility. Okay, and what we're looking for is beta one blocking. Okay, we wanna block those beta one receptors. Okay, let's see what else. Um, heparin we can give to break up the clot. Um, so those are all fine. Okay. Excellent. Let's move on to the next. Oh my goodness. Yes. Okay. So this is, this is really an important chart. Um, I actually took this and I retyped it in from, um, first aid. Um, I probably could have just taken a screenshot, but whatever, it's fine. We're, we're here now. Um, these are our stages of myocardial injury. When you, uh, receive your first aid book in the mail, please open it to the cardiology chapter and put a big star on this chart because this, this is definitely great material for your exam. There's so many ways they can ask about this. And so I love, love, love this chart. What, what's given here is what are the things, number one, that you see on gross pathology? If our patient dies in this period of time and we look at their heart, what do we see? Okay, so we have our gross pathology here. Second, if we take that heart and we uh, take a little bit of the area that died and put it under the microscope, what are we gonna see on histology? Okay, and so histologically, what do we look for? And third, what are the um, what are the complications that we can see during this time period? And this is an especially important thing. I'm actually going to put this is a two star topic. What are some of the complications during this time period that we can see? Because uh, and to tell you what they're going to do is they are going to give you a patient with one of these complications, and then they're gonna ask you, how long ago was a heart attack? Okay, this is a question that you will see over and over and over and over again. They'll describe it, and they wanna know how long the heart ago the heart attack was, okay? So let's just quickly go through this diagram and talk about each. So the first day on gross pathology, we're seeing modeling, okay? Modeling is really just where the heart starts to take a really dark, uh, purpley, reddish, bluish color, okay? It just looks very abnormal, but uh, it's hard to really tell whether there was damage to that area or not, okay? This is the very early stages. When you look on histology, you can see some coagulative necrosis, some reperfusion injury, where you had a dead area that got blood supply. When you have any area of your body that dies and then gets blood supply, what happens is calcium ends up causing a destruction of the cells there, okay? And so reperfusion injury is always gonna be secondary to calcium, okay? Calcium is the big offender there. Wavy fibers, contraction band necrosis is because of all of that um, troponins and you know all of those little cardiac proteins interacting with each other. Uh, when those myocytes die, they kind of get stuck together and contract and really pull the sides of the cell together. And so contraction band necrosis is just sort of that buzzword thing that you need to know for the first 24 hours. When we hit one to three days, we have hyperemia, um, which is basically just uh, redness. It's more red than the area around it, essentially. So there's the first 72 hours. We're going to have an extra red area, coagulative necrosis on histology, and now our neutrophils have moved in. 
And sort of one of our rules of pathology is that the first 72 hours belongs to neutrophils. Whatever the disease is, if you're talking about uh, an abscess in your skin, if you're talking about you know a, a myocardial infarction, any type of damage, 72 hours belongs to neutrophils. Okay, and so whenever you see neutrophils, think about something that just happened within the past three days. During the first three days is where we can see fibrinous pericarditis. Okay, fibrinous pericarditis is essentially just an inflammation of the pericardium. Um, and so we should see a patient that has all those classic symptoms, you know, has that chest pain that gets a little bit worse when they lean forward. Uh, they're going to have that pericardial crunch. Um, and so that's our fibrinous pericarditis. And that's got to be in the first three days. Okay. As we move from three days to two weeks, here we're going to have a very bright red border of the lesion wherever the area that has died of the heart is is going to be bright red and in the center it's starting to turn yellow brown as those neutrophils are now converting to macrophages that are dropping down a lot of you know scar material and just really starting to make a granulation tissue not scar material excuse me this is an important point uh, that granulation tissue when you look at it on gross pathology looks yellow when you look on histopathology, we see granulation and macrophages. Granulation tissue is just sort of that early tissue. It doesn't have the strength of scar tissue. It's basically the first layer that you lay down to kind of like hold the fort while you start laying down scar tissue, okay? And so this is a very important point. Granulation tissue is weak. Now, the heart can't really take two weeks off while it waits for scar tissue to be made, right? It can't just kind of like, check out and be like, okay, I'll be back in two weeks whenever you're ready. I'm not going to pump until then. No. Throughout this entire process, your heart is still pumping. It's still expected to deal with these pressures of 120 millimeters of mercury, 80 millimeters of mercury. These very high pressures is expected to deal with. Those pressures are going to be translated into pressure against that very weak tissue in the wall. And so the things that we look for, for three to 14 days, free wall rupture. If we have a heart attack that involves the free wall of the heart, we can have rupture during this period and during this period only. If you have a patient who had a free wall rupture, please pick an answer that involves three to 14 days. Papillary muscle rupture. Here, this is probably going to present with some mitral regurgitation, right? The most common uh, papillary muscle two rupture is a is the anterior lateral papillary muscle that's responsible for keeping the mitral valve shut. And so if you have a patient who presents with a new onset mitral regurgitation, that's gonna be within that two week period, okay? Intraventricular septum rupture uh, and a pseudoaneurysm, okay? And so these three uh, complications are all gonna be dependent on where the infarction was where is the dead tissue if the dead tissue involves the free wall you could see a free wall rupture okay and so for free wall rupture you need to have an occlusion in the left circumflex artery okay the left circumflex why the left circumflex provides blood supply to the lateral wall okay and so for free wall rupture it's going to be due to left circumflex for papillary muscle rupture and IV septum rupture, we're looking for a infarct in the left anterior descending artery. Okay, so depending on where the uh, obstruction was, uh, will sort of let you know what are the possible complications. Okay, now our long term sequelae two weeks to months, uh, we're going to end up with a gray white scar. Uh, on histopathology, we look for type 1 collagen. Why? Because type 1 collagen makes up scar tissue. And for long-term sequelae, Dressler syndrome is an autoimmune disorder that leads to a pericarditis. Okay, so autoimmune pericarditis. This is different from our fibrinous pericarditis. Dressler syndrome is autoimmunity. Um, and so that's an important caveat. And it doesn't happen until a long period later. Heart failure, if we lose a significant amount of tissue, uh, 
you know, we have scar tissue now instead of muscle. And so the heart is not going to be able to pump as effectively uh, and it may lead to heart failure. And when we have death of muscle, we're also going to have death of the conduction. And so electrical signaling is going to become disordered and we can start to see arrhythmias. Okay. All right. So again, very important chart here. When you get your first aid book, please uh, put a star by this because this has a lot of um, a lot of potential questions can come out of this chart. Okay. Great. Okay. And so our congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure. Um, the big idea here, and I, this is something, Natalia, I think you're already pretty comfortable with, is that depending on what side of your heart is failing, presents differently. Okay, and when we talked about this on Monday, uh, our left congestive heart failure tends to lead to pulmonary edema. Why? Because the lungs are directly upstream of the left heart, so we expect to see that. Pulmonary hypertension, which is causing that edema. Intraalveolar hemorrhage, as we have that high blood pressure in those tiny little alveoli, some of those alveoli are gonna rupture and leak blood into the alveolus itself, leading to hemorrhage, okay? And the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure, right? Yes, uh, so, so uh, this is commonly gonna be caused by ischemia, hypertension, some kind of cardiomyopathy, myocardial infarct. There's a lot of reasons we can get left congestive heart failure, but know what it looks like, okay? If you have that pulmonary edema, if you're hearing crackles, think left congestive heart failure, okay? Right congestive heart failure, again, most commonly caused by left, can also be caused by core pulmonale. And so we talked about how um, if you have some issue with the vasculature of your lungs, so if you have a patient who's had repeated pulmonary emboli and now has a high resistance in their lung uh, arteries, that can lead to a higher pressure just, just affecting the right side of the heart, okay? Left to right shunts as well puts an increased strain on the right side of the heart and so that can lead to right heart failure. Um, although it can also lead to reversal of that shunt and give you cyanosis. Things we look for with right heart failure, dependent pitting edema in the legs, increased JVP, hepatosplenomegaly, our nutmeg liver. These are all things we talked about last time, right? And, uh, and uh, I think we're pretty comfortable with why those things occur, right? Yeah, any questions here? No. Anorexia, complaints of GI distress, as we have all that edema in the wall of our GI tract, expect your patients not to want to eat too much, okay? So valvular disorders, we really, um, we've really spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, our aortic valve stenosis giving us that mid-systolic murmur. Uh, one thing we haven't really focused on too much is what that can lead to. And so stenosis leads to that concentric left ventricular hypertrophy where you have the muscle in the wall of your heart growing quite a bit. So here's our myocardium, and here's our left ventricular space, kind of tiny, I can't even write in it. So now we have that concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. It's not gonna really be able to fill with a lot of blood, okay? And so we can start to have um, uh, almost a cardiogenic shock due to that. Uh, stable angina, as we increase the amount of need for oxygen in our cardiac muscle. A microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So how do we get hemolytic anemia from aortic valve stenosis? This is the same way we got hemolytic anemia from our bacterial endocarditis, right? So we have this valve that's very thin, very stenotic. It's got all this calcium on the edges of it. So as red blood cells try and pass through here, they're gonna get sheared or cut open by the edge of that valve, okay? And that will lead to our anemia, okay? Uh, aortic valve regurge, this is an early diastolic blowing murmur. I told you whenever you have an early diastolic murmur, please choose aortic regurge. Uh, this can lead to eccentric hypertrophy where instead of having the wall increasing all the way around, instead we have, here's our ventricular space and here is the uh, muscle. Really, it's just eccentric. It's off to the side. 
that's where we have our hypertrophy is just on the side of the uh, ventricle. Uh, left ventricular dilation, as it's having to deal with a lot more blood. Uh, we talked about that increased pulse pressure. Uh, because there's that high pulse pressure, we can actually see some pretty bizarre physical symptoms. Um, so head bobbing is the one that always like uh, blows my mind. So you have your patient. They have a systolic blood pressure of 180 and a diastolic blood pressure of 60. We talked about why that happens. The heart has to pump that blood a lot harder, giving you a much higher systolic blood pressure. And during diastole, we have blood going back into the left ventricle. And so our diastolic blood pressure drops, right? So much higher systolic, much lower diastolic. Because of this, that pressure is going to be translated into the carotids. And so when you have that high blood pressure, it's going to kind of knock your patient's head back. As we get into diastole, the blood pressure gets lower, and so the head is going to kind of drop. And so with aortic valve regurg, you can actually see with the cardiac cycle a, a slight kind of head bob, right? Like we're listening to some really good Drake, right? Kiki, do you love me, right? That's what we're looking for with aortic valve regurg, this head bobbing as we get that um, high uh, blood pressure in systole and low in diastole. Okay, great. Uh, mitral valve stenosis, mid-diastolic murmur, like you told me before. This is caused by uh, chronic rheumatic heart disease. It leads to pulmonary edema as we have that translation of pressure. Pulmonary hemorrhage, hypertension, right congestive heart failure. Whenever we have a dilation of the atria, we said the big problem that we worry about with dilation of the atria is AFib. Okay, and so that's AFib. Um, and uh, I don't really have time to give you the, my spiel on AFib and why it's happening. So we will start off when we meet on Monday talking about AFib. Don't let me forget. Um, and let me just finish this slide. So we have mural thrombi, uh, mitral valve prolapse. We look for a mid-systolic murmur with an uh, ejection click. Uh, and this is due to myxoid degeneration, which is associated with some other disorders. Uh, such as lupus, a lot of these autoimmune disorders can give us this mitral valve prolapse, as well as Marfan's syndrome. Okay, I'm just going to write Marfan because that's one. I that's probably the most common that they ask about with mitral valve prolapse, Marfan syndrome. Mitral valve regurg. Again, we want a systolic murmur because this valve is supposed to be closed during systole. Regurg means it's not. So holostock blowing murmur. It's caused by prolapse for a long-term left ventricular dilation. We spread out the leaflets of the valve, giving us regurg. Papillary muscle rupture. This we're looking for days 3 to 14 after a heart attack, right? That's where papillary muscle rupture happens, as well as free, free wall rupture, as well as intraventricular septal rupture. It's all during that 3 to 14 day span, okay? Acute rheumatic fever as well, okay? Great. So when we meet on Monday, I'm going to give you my spiel on AFib, what it is and why it is so bad and how it leads to strokes. Uh, we're going to talk about our dilated cardiomyopathies. And we have a few questions that are very fun. We will go through together. Uh, last, we'll do very, very quickly talk about EKGs. Uh, for the most part, um, there, you will see EKGs on your exam. But, uh, but we're, I'm just going to kind of talk about the, what you need to know for your exam, okay? Because EKG is a big topic, okay? And then we'll do a quick talk about all of the different pharma drugs, okay? And then we will be done with cardio. We can move to palm. Um, and I just love cardio, so we're going to spread it into three days, okay? Um, great. Uh, if you have any questions, you're studying over the weekend and uh, something comes up, it's different from what I said or you want me to go over something again, please do not hesitate to email me um, and let me know. I'm always happy to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Any, any questions, anything um, before we go? No? Okay. Well, uh, Natalia, I hope you have a great weekend and I will see you on Monday. Yeah, you're welcome. Good night.